will reconvene at 1 p.m. Senator thank, Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Counselor, you're at Butler Snow? Yes, sir. Uh, your, your partner? Yes, sir. Okay. It's a good law firm. Um, I have some experience uh, with our Department of Motor Vehicles in Louisiana. I, uh, I spent a year there one time trying to get my son's lost license renewed. I remember, uh, remember all they had, I didn't bring any reading, and I remember all they had were copies of Pop Door Mechanics from like 1997 or something to read. Our, our problem in Louisiana is uh, our employees there are good. It's our, it's our politically appointed managers. Uh, I was asked one time, how many managers do we have at our, how many managers work at our Louisiana Department of Motor Vehicles? And I said about half. Uh, <laughs> Uh, let me ask you a couple of questions. First, you, you, you did I understand you, your participation in Boys and Girls Club. Tell me about that briefly. Thank, thank you, Senator, for that question. So as a youth, I grew up, that was uh, like my home away from home uh, yeah. from the time I was nine, year, nine years old until uh, I went off to, to, till I went to college. I went yeah, to college it's, and, it's a really good organization. Absolutely. Uh, every, every year or two, um, Mr. Denzel Washington, who's one of the five coolest people on the planet, uh, comes up here to uh, lobby for money, not for himself, for Boys and Girls Club, so I've had a chance to get to know a little bit about it. Um, you worked at the, well, let me ask you this. Do you think America is mostly good or mostly bad? Uh, thank you, Senator, for you're, that, that question. You're welcome. Um, I believe that America is the greatest country in the world. Um, I don't know in any other country where I could be in this position to come from where I come from and be in a position to be nominated to the Sixth Circuit and be speaking to uh, senators. I could have nev never imagined this uh, happening. And maybe it happens in other countries, but this, uh, it's the Amer greatest country in the world to me. Um, I agree with you. Look, I, I don't know whose fault it was, um, but you may want to go back and talk to your friends at the White House. It is, it is, uh, it's very unfortunate that that Senator Blackburn and Senator Haggerty didn't have a chance to sit down with you. And and I don't want to get into whose fault it was, uh, but it's the the White House's job to make sure that that happens, if they really care about what we think. And I gave this same speech to uh, employees at President Trump's White House as well. Um, for, for, for a while, my experience with some of the people in charge at the Trump White House was different from Senator uh, Durbin's. Um, um, I was brand new, and their attitude was per toward me was pretty cavalier. It was just sort of sit down and shut up, and uh, uh, it's just it's 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 not cool when our nominees don't take it upon, upon themselves if the White House doesn't encourage it to go sit down with the senators. It's not fair. It puts us in a horrible position. It's disrespectful. You're going to be appointed if you're confirmed to one of the most powerful jobs on the planet. And that's not an exaggeration. Um, you have a lifetime appointment. Um, and uh, I wish you'd deliver that message. T tell me in the few minutes I have left, tell me that your work, yeah, well, let me, let, me, let me try this. It's been, a, it's been suggested you don't have any experience, okay? And you don't have the experience to be on the Court of Appeal. Um, can you address that? Tell me what your answer is to that. Uh, thank you, Senator Kennedy, for uh, that question. Um, throughout my career, I've handled uh, 23 appeals uh, to conclusion. And I have one matter pending before the Sixth Circuit. In the vast majority of the appeals that I've handled, I have been the primary drafter uh, of those, uh, of the uh, appellate briefs. 
Uh, I've argued 10 cases to the Tennessee Court of Appeals and the Tennessee Court of Criminal Appeals. Uh, I have not argued a case uh, to the Sixth Circuit. Um, additionally, I have significant trial experience having tried uh, 19 cases in federal court and state court. Um, and, and that doesn't take into account the, uh, I've litigated hundreds of cases. And, and as, as you know, some cases are sometimes resolved by settlement, some by dispositive motions. Uh, so I have that experience as well. Okay. I'm over, over time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Kennedy. I want to make a matter of record here. When a Supreme Court Justice Amy Coney Barrett was nominated Senator Kennedy, I went a little over, and you're welcome to do the same if you wish. Thank you, my friend. Uh, congratulations to all of you. I hope to be able to ask each of you some questions, but I do want to stay within my, uh, my time limit. Let's start with Ms. Clark. Um, <clears throat> You've been nominated by President Biden, served on the federal district court, which means, of course, that uh, the Court of Appeal is going to review all of your decisions. Um, what is the, the appellate standard of review for um, question of fact? Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. Um, I have not... Uh, worked on a, an appeal in my, my 14 years of experience. Um, I believe that um, uh, it is reviewed um, based on abuse of discretion would be this. No, it's uh, clear error. Clear error. As the federal district court judge, you're going to have a lot of, of discretion uh, on determining facts. How about if somebody appeals one of your decision and they say you made a mistake on the law. What's the appellate standard of re review? Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. Again, You're as I, 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 I mentioned, um, I have not uh, worked on appeals. If a question like that came um, uh, before me, um, I would thoroughly research the law. I understand that there's de novo review, abuse of discretion, and clear error are the, are the different um, standards. Okay, but you don't, you don't know today the answer. Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. It would, it would be welcome. something that I would need to research further. Okay. Um, how, how about a mixed question of, of fact and law? What's the standard of review on that? Thank you for the question, Senator. You're Again, um, uh, my understanding are that the different levels of review are de novo, um, abuse of discretion, and clear error. Well, but that's a question of law and fact is going to, is different. Thank you for the question, Senator. You're Again, in my, in my 14 years of experience, that is not an issue um, uh, that has confronted me. Okay. All right. Well, you, you're, you're, you've been nominated for the Southern District, I think. Is that right? That is correct. So you'll see a lot of securities cases? Yes. Okay. Tell me what uh, SEC Rule 10b-5 is. Uh, that's a, a rule that deals with fraud. Um, I have... Uh, uh, not uh, litigated a securities uh, matter. Uh, if I were um, uh, to confront one, I would thoroughly research Second Circuit and Supreme Court precedent, and I would um, apply the law to the facts. Ms. Clark, you've been nominated to the Southern District of New York. It's where most of our securities cases are litigated. And rule, SEC Rule 10b-5 is about as basic as you can get. You want to take another crack at that and tell me what Rule 10b-5 does? Uh, thank you again for the question, Senator. I, I regularly confront uh, new issues of law in, in my practice, and when I do, I thoroughly research the I, issue. I know you're going to thoroughly research it, but are you telling me today you don't know what Rule 10b-5 is? I only have that basic understanding. Okay. All right. Um, let me ask Ms. Franklin and Ms. Williams a question. Your jurisdiction, let me be sure I get the title correct. Uh, Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. I got that right? Your jurisdiction is pretty broad, isn't it? Uh, 
So the jurisdiction is broad in some ways in that uh, the board has oversight over counterintelligence programs across the intelligence community uh, with regard to privacy and civil liberties, but it's focused on counterintelligence with, or it's focused on counterterrorism, not all privacy and civil liberties issues. Right, right, okay. I, I think this is a very important board, but I'm sitting here thinking We spent three, four years with some, some, not all, I'm going to emphasize that, but some, not all, members of our FBI and our Department of Justice selling the Steele dossier. Does that embarrass you? So, so, Senator, I think, um, you know, there have been three inspector general reports with regards to some of the things that went on, and um, I think that the recommendations in them are, are a good recommendation. Well, let me ask you this, do you, Ms. Wayne. Do you think the Steele dossier is true? Uh, well, Senator, I, I have no basis to believe uh, it's true or, either way. I, I I you don't, don't have an opinion. I mean, I I don't I don't have any factual basis to know whether or not I I do what I from what I've read it sounds like there's some concerns with the way it was procured. So you don't you, I'm, I don't understand. Yeah. Do you believe it's true or not true? So I, I haven't read the Steele dossier, but from from the news reports, it sounds like there may be falsehoods in it. But again, I don't have personal okay. knowledge of it. Um, Ms. Franklin, do you know if it, do you have an opinion on whether it's true or not true? I also have not had access to read the dossier, but I can say that I share your concern. Yeah, but I, you I, know if it's true, I'm going to ask. I, I want to understand where you're coming from. Do you believe it's true or not true? I believe that uh, the Inspector General of the Justice Department found. Uh, significant problems in three reports, including 17 significant errors or omissions in right. the FISA applications regarding so Carter you believe Page. It's not true. I believe that the Inspector General found these errors and omissions, which are highly concerning. You agree with the Inspector General? I I find the re Inspector General's report very convincing. Yes. Okay. So you don't believe the Steele dossier is true? I. Why is it so hard for you? Oh, tell me what you think here. That's pretty basic. I would turn to the errors and omissions that the Inspector General did point to, which were significant, and I uh, know that Congress has attempted to take steps to address those. Well, here's what I'm getting at. I mean, I can tell y'all the one answer, and I really, really regret that. I mean, I, this, this to me is, it's not political. It was this, these allegations that turned out not to be true. It doesn't matter who they were about, but the, the, some members of our federal government put the full force and weight of the power of the office behind this dossier. And it didn't matter whether who, who they were, and I, I can't believe you can't agree with me that it's not true. I mean, the, the, there have been three inspectors general reports. Where, where, where was your agency? Did anybody at your agency stand up and say, wait a minute, before we make all these allegations on the basis of the Steele dossier, shouldn't we check whether they're true? I mean, FBI Director Comey sold this thing for five years. James Clapper was prepared to make a public statement that, that we, we, we're not sure if the, if the dossier is accurate, and, and uh, Director Comey called him and said, no, don't say that. Where were you guys at the board? You're supposed to protect civil liberties. You're supposed to protect privacy. Does it matter whose privacy and civil, civil, civil liberties are being infringed? Either one. 
So Senator, I wasn't at the board. I haven't been at the board yet, but I agree with you that that is exactly the role of the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, right? Thank to you. Ensure, to ensure that the privacy and civil liberties are, of Americans are taken into account and to make sure that our intelligence agencies are being completely forthright and truthful well, with well, the decision Thank makers. you for that. Well, you were there, Ms. Franklin, right? You no, weren't there? No, no Senator. Okay, I, well, I when, you, when you both get there, I, I wish you would talk to your colleagues over there. They ought to hide their heads on a bag. They're in charge of protecting American civil liberties and privacy, and it doesn't matter who you are. And they sat there sucking on their teeth like a bump on a log and never said a word. I'm done. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman, and I like you, your haircut. <laughs> <laughs> haven't had one in a while. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. And uh, uh, I'd just like to say to those who are new to this uh, environment that the uh, many bar exam that Senator Kennedy gives to many of these uh, witnesses reminds me of my anxiety in law school where I sat in the last row and slumped down to the point where I have curvature of the spine in the hopes that I wouldn't be called on to answer uh, what 15B is or anything like that. But uh, nevertheless, always entertaining and always well presented. The second uh, objection made by the senator relates to your lack of candor. On this side of the table, we're a different branch of government than what you're aspiring to, by and large. Uh, and we have opinions on everything and express them willingly, particularly if it's televised. And uh, very seldom hold back. We know that on the judicial side, the opposite is true. You don't want to put yourself on the record in a situation that may disqualify you from a case and the frustration Senator Kennedy feels with some of your lack of candor we felt on the Democratic side with the other administration. It, it is by nature a reflection on the uh, branches of government being a little different in philosophical approach, to say the least. So before I adjourn today, I want to thank you for um, uh, cooperation and patience especially to Caroline and Jamie. Are they still back there? Good. Good job, kids. Uh, questions for the record will be due to the nominees by 5 p.m. on Wednesday, January 19th, and the record remains open until that time to submit letters and similar materials. And with that, this hearing is stands adjourned. Thank you both. Thank you, Senator Thank you. Tester. Senator Kennedy from Louisiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Governor, Director, congratulations on your nomination. Uh, Governor, I, I realize at the Federal Reserve that you have a, a big staff that advises you on inflation. And based on their track record, my guess is they also advised people to buy condos in Las Vegas in 2007. But you don't have to accept their, their advice. So with respect to your predictions on inflation, how did you get it so wrong? Well, uh, Senator, thank Could you. Could you move closer to the mic for me? Yes, of course. Thank you for your question, Senator. You're welcome. So I think, you know, nobody got the pandemic right. Um, the pandemic is unprecedented. We've yeah, but I'm asking you about inflation. Yeah, so um, I think as, as uh, forecasters, private forecasters, um, certainly uh, the forecasters, um, the SEP, uh, the, the whole committee, um, we uh, thought uh, that perhaps uh, we would see a more rapid resolution of the pandemic and the supply demand mismatches, so in particular you, you, in cars. Excuse me for interrupting, but, but I don't have much time. Do you think, you, are you saying that inflation was caused by the pandemic? So we certainly have seen um, the uh, perpetuation, for instance, of the Delta variant uh, leading to. Yes, yes ma'am, but are you saying that? The inflation is caused by the pandemic. I certainly think the supply demand imbalances that have been the biggest contributors um, to the very high inflation we've seen are directly attributable to supply chain issues, distortions in demand. Well, well but here's what troubles me about that. Um, I'll, agree, I'll agree that inflation is spreading, but I don't see people going around coughing inflation on each other. 
Uh, I, I think, uh, and I understand supply chains matter, but so does the demand side, and so does too much money chasing too few goods. And, and uh, I, I don't think, and I don't think any fair-minded person thinks that inflation is solely the result of the pandemic. Let me, let me move on. Do you think that uh, federal regulatory authorities should use their considerable power, not just the Federal Reserve, but federal regulatory authorities, do you think they should use their considerable power to discourage private banks from lending money to oil and gas companies? No. Ma'am? No. Okay. Do you think that uh, those federal regulatory authorities should use their power to discourage private banks from lending money to gun manufacturers and dealers? It's not our job. We don't tell banks uh, what sectors to lend to. We just ask them to risk manage, and we make okay. sure they have good processes in well, place. I, I agree with you, and I thank you for that. Will you issue a statement to that effect if you're confirmed? Well, I certainly uh, have made that statement. We'll continue to, to make yes, that Yes, ma'am. Would you issue a separate statement saying, I want to make it clear to, for what it's worth to all of my colleagues in government, I don't think that you should use your power to, to discourage private banks from lending money to oil and gas companies and, uh, and to gun manufacturers. Well, will you tell, do that? Well, I won't tell other regulators what to do, but I, I will be happy to talk about what we do at the, at the Federal Reserve, what our, what our statutory authorities require us to do. Okay. Um, I'm going to follow up with you on that. Okay. Senator. Uh, I take that as a yes, and, and I'm looking forward to that statement. Um, director, gosh, I, this is, this is America's debt. I'm not going to have time to ask you about it because I want to ask Director Thompson a quick question. I mean, yes, Director Thompson. Direct, Madam Director, are you familiar with President Biden's uh, risk rating 2.0 uh, pricing scheme for the National Flood Insurance Program? Uh, sir, I don't, I'm not familiar with the details of that program. Well, I need you to take a look at it. You talk about affordability. President Biden is about to make housing for at least 500, 5 million Americans unaffordable by raising their flood insurance from $1,000 a year to five and $6,000 a year, and you're going to have a problem. Um, real quickly, Madam... Governor, do you think we've got four big banks? They have market share between 30% and 50% in the greatest economy in all of human history. They're not really banks, they're countries. Do you think power, economic power, is too concentrated in those four banks? <clears throat> Well, I certainly think that from a financial stability point of view, uh, when you have very, very large institutions that are systemic, uh, you need to have very, very big capital buffers and liquidity buffers and risk management because it would be very, very difficult to resolve those banks in a moment of financial stress. Okay. My, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You've been thank very, you, very Kennedy. kind with your time. My office will work with you on that statement about oil and gas and gun manufacturers. Thank you, Senator. Okay. Senator Warner from Virginia is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to, first of all, take a moment. Um, I know normally in the Banking Committee we don't introduce our witnesses. All of you. Um, Judge Sykes, do you think America is mostly good or mostly bad? Senator Kennedy, I think America is mostly good. Thank you. How about you? Uh, Councilor Roshan? I agree. I think it's mostly good. Good. How about you, Judge? Mostly good, Senator. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll start back here again. Uh, Judge Sykes, tell me about, uh, tell me what the Dober, some say Dober, some say Dobert. I'm from Louisiana, so some, sometimes we say Dober. Tell me what the Dober or Dobert standard is. Senator Kennedy, in my eight years of practice uh, as a Superior Court judge and presiding in the state of California, 
I have not had occasion uh, to uh, hear that the doe bear. Um, so I can assure you, though, that I have had occasion where, in a civil matter, I may not have known something, and I do the research necessary to discover and to research whatever it is that I need to do to make myself familiar with that. So I can assure you that, in this case, I would do the same. So you'll look it up? Yes, Senator. I would do whatever it takes to make myself familiar with that and okay. be prepared to go forward. All right. Can you tell me... Um, as a as a federal judge, give me an instance where you will apply federal procedural law, but state substantive law. Uh, thank you, Senator, for that question. In regards to an instance, I cannot think of an instance off uh, the top of my head, but I am familiar with the Erie Doctrine, mm -hmm. which uh, guides that process. Okay. Um, and the Erie Doctrine does require that. What's it say? Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> sorry. The, the Erie Doctrine does require that I would follow uh, uh, federal procedural law and state substantive law. OK. Uh, you're nominated for judge Southern District of New York? No. No, Senator. I'm, sorry. I, I'm nominated for the Central District of California. Oh, okay. I apologize. Um, is it Judge Cato or Cato? Judge Cato. Cato. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, you're going to be on Southern District in New York if confirmed. Is that right? Central District of California. Central District. What, I thought there were two of you that were going to be on the Southern District in New York. No? Okay. All right. Um, If, if, um, can you tell me what the Fourth Amendment is and, and, uh, the, 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 the rule of search and seizure and what the exceptions are? Thank you for that question, Senator. The Fourth Amendment prohibits search or seizure without a warrant. Uh huh. And, and the exceptions to it? The exceptions are quite numerous. Uh, so I certainly wouldn't be Just able to. Give me a to couple. Give Border search, ex exigent circumstances. Um, you know, off the top of my head, I can't give you the full list, but there are quite a few. Okay. Suppose California said, uh, look, we appreciate the guidance of the U.S. Supreme Court on the, the warrant requirement and, uh, and the exceptions, but we're not going to follow the exceptions here in California. If you want to arrest somebody, you better have a warrant. Can California do that? Senator, it, it, it would be um, contrary to the Code of Canon, for specifically Canon Code of Conduct, specifically Canon 3, for me to give an opinion on a hypothetical like that. Come on, Judge. I, I don't, I, I, don't, don't dodge my question. This is really basic constitutional law. Um, can California decide it's not going to follow the exceptions to the warrant requirement? Certainly, Senator, if, if California decided to do that, I would imagine it would be an issue that would be litigated. I would imagine, too. But can they? who's going to win if they litigate it? Well, Senator... The first issue would be that pursuant to the Pullman abstention doctrine, that would be the type of issue that a federal court would defer to the state to allow the state to decide in the first instance whether or not it could perhaps right, be but resolved. But suppose the state did it. This is what I'm getting to. Suppose that California said, we appreciate it, Supreme Court. I'm way over. I'm sorry. You need to look that up. Okay, it's pretty basic. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. No, you're perfectly welcome. And I would just say that uh, I want to congratulate the panel on facing the Kennedy Bar Exam, which uh, occasionally is administered in this room. And we are fortunate that the uh, rules and decorum of the committee do not allow him to ask us the same questions, uh, because we would struggle with them, I'm sure, as well. Senator Feinstein? Chairman. to meet these nominees, but I look forward to your responses. 
Thanks, Senator Minutes. Senator Kennedy from Louisiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Jefferson, Dr. Cook, I'm, I may not get to ask you many questions today because I want to concentrate on, on uh, Ms. Raskin's proposal to, to uh, change the mission of the Federal Reserve. But um, I've read about both of you. Um, it's clear to me we disagree on some things in terms of our politics, but in America you can believe what you want. That's why it's such a great country. Um, uh, Dr. Jefferson, you're at, I believe you're at Davidson. You're a professor there. Yeah, there's no better place in America to get a liberal arts education. Uh, Dr. Cook, um, you are a Truman Scholar, yes. and you are a Marshall Scholar. You were at St. Hilda's? Yes. Okay. You ever met a, a Marshall Scholar that was a dummy? No, Senator. Me neither. Um, the, the, the only advice for what it was, was worth, that, for what it's worth that I have for each of you is, number one, please don't change the mission of the Federal Reserve. Please don't let it be politicized. Uh, and number two, don't get caught up in the group think over there. Okay? Uh, only dead fish go with the flow. Don't, don't, don't get caught up in the group think. Now, Ms. Raskin. May of 2020, the world economy is melting down because government shut it down. We're trying to hold it together with bailing wire, duct tape, spit, and happy thoughts. And you say, that's great, but we ought to let oil and gas companies go broke. Did you really mean that? Well, thank you, Senator Kennedy. You're welcome. For that question. And the Federal Reserve has particular mandates set yes, out but, by but, law. But I'm, I know about all that, but did you, I mean, did you mean it? You said it. Here it is. Big as Dallas. I read the op-ed. You said, save everybody but the oil and gas industry and let them go broke. Did you really mean that? So I have been clear on my views. The whole point of the op-ed was that the Fed should not pick winners and losers. Except the, for oil and gas. You said they ought to be allowed to go broke. The Fed should not pick or favor any sector at all. Then why did you say it? The Fed is not in the business of choosing winners and losers. Then why did you recommend to them that they, they let oil and gas go broke? I did not recommend. Yes, ma'am, I read the op-ed. There I, it is. It's, uh, I'm not going to quote it to you, but Senator Toomey pointed out. Why? Did, did you mean it? Senator Kennedy, I want you to understand the role of the, the, the proper role of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve should not be choosing winners and losers. Yes, ma'am. So you disagree with the editorial? The editorial was one that I wrote. And I wrote it in the context of the Federal Reserve's emergency lending facilities. This was a special program set up by the CARES Act, by the Congress, that appropriated taxpayer money. This was a, an issue quite unlike the issue of supervision. And, and, and you said don't give the money to oil and gas. Let them go broke. Because in my opinion, they're bad for the environment. The, Didn't you? The, I, I want you to understand the context for that article. This had, that article had to do with, and didn't have, did not have to do with supervision and regulation. Dr. That Raskin, you said it, you ought to own it, okay? You ought to own it. I'd Sorry? Respect, you said it, you ought to own what you said. I'd respect you more if you did. Let me, let me move on to this business of allocating capital. Now look, this is America. You can believe what you want, and I mean that. But I don't agree w w with your mission to politicize the Federal Reserve. I don't believe it, the Federal Reserve should be politicized either. Well, well, then why did you say it? Why did you say in this June 2020 piece, quote, federal regulatory bodies should allocate capital? 
It is not the role of the Federal Reserve in supervisory or regulatory matters in its functioning as... Then why did you write it? It was written in a context, Senator, that had to do with emergency lending. It did not have to do with the context of supervision I, I, I mean, and regulation. Some, so, I feel strongly about charter schools, okay? If some president or some chairman of the Federal Reserve said, let's all get together and, and uh, allocate capital away, lean on all the banks so they don't fund charter schools. You support that? I mean, you support... You support driving oil and gas industry into bankruptcy. Would, do you think that would be the proper role for the Federal Reserve? No, obviously not. The Federal Reserve is not to get involved in allocating credit to any particular sector. So you changed your mind? I have made my, my, myself completely clear. The whole point of the op-ed was that the Fed should not pick winners and losers or expose taxpayers to undue well, risk. Well, did Senator, Senator, Senator uh, Kennedy, your time's expired. Well, no, you, you went three minutes over. Mike. I did, and so did Senator Toomey, but we need this hearing done by 11 o'clock. Well, can I ask Go one to more? Uh, no, you've already gone two minutes over. Senator Warner, uh, you're recognized, Senator from Virginia. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would say to my, my friend from Louisiana, uh, I think you're appropriate admonition about uh, only dead fish go with the flow. Maybe that could be applied to both sides on our partisan basis, too, as senators. Well, I, I agree with that. I don't even know what parties they're in. I, I understand. I appreciate that. Ms. Raskin, it, Bloom Raskin, it's good to see you. I, I do want to note, um, you know, we all know you've got progressive views, but I've been actually very surprised and pleasantly surprised by the number of Virginia bankers who uh, Ms. Naranjo, did I say your name right? I'm sorry for all yes, your you troubles. Yes, you did. Thank you. I'm sorry for all your troubles. Thank you. Um, Mr. Zimbro, tell my, tell my old friend Phil Gelston I said hi. Yes, sir, I will do that. Very, so. uh... He had warm, warm regards to send to you. Well, and fine lawyer. Fine lawyer. Professor Skeel, with respect to a divisional merger, and then a bankruptcy. Does the bankruptcy judge or does the bankruptcy court make a uh, distinction between a divisional merger bankruptcy in good faith and one in bad faith? Uh, yes, I think a bankruptcy judge would. I think they would. they would look at the bad co, to use the term that um, we've adopted from Judge Fitzgerald, uh, they'd look at bad co and they'd ask the question, is that an entity that is in bankruptcy for a proper bankruptcy purpose? And if you set up a, a, a bad co that had real assets in it and it had the liabilities as well, you, you might say, yes, that's, that's a proper purpose for that um, uh, for for that entity, but the the judge looks at what went on in the particular divisional merger and and makes a decision. Let me explore that a minute. I, I've not ever practiced in bankruptcy court. Um, when a divisional merger is done, and then there's a bankruptcy, and you have two companies. I'll use the terms rich co and poor co as opposed to good and bad. Um, does the bankruptcy, I, I assume that, that counsel for the creditors is raising fresh hell and saying this divisional merger was in bad faith and it was only done to avoid liabilities. Assuming that's, assume that's one of the allegations. Does the bankruptcy judge then hold a hearing and look to Porco and its present and prior management and say, tell me why you th did this divisional merger? And if they say to avoid our liabilities, does the bankruptcy judge then have authority to say, no, get out of my courtroom? The answer to that would be yes. You know, I'll unpack it just a little bit if I can. So um, 
you do the divisional merger. You know, there's nothing strange about a divisional merger in concept. I mean, you, you can have perfectly appropriate divisional mer mergers and nobody thinks about it until we end up in bankruptcy. But if you do a, a divisional merger and then you put Badco or Cork, uh, Porco into, um, into bankruptcy, and the creditors, the victims, challenge the bankruptcy, say it was filed in bad faith, then the bankruptcy judge assesses the divisional merger, the Texas two-step, and determines whether it belongs in bankruptcy or not. And the, the standards that courts use vary a little bit from court to court, but the, the standard that will apply in Johnson & Johnson, for instance, which is the Third Circuit standard, the, the Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit, what the court will ask is, was there a valid bankruptcy purpose? That was the first question. And then the second question is, was this bankruptcy filed simply to gain a tactical advantage um, in litigation? And if it's not a valid bankruptcy purpose or it was solely for a tactical advantage, the court will kick the case out. And there is a hearing in Johnson & Johnson in, in its um, divisional uh, merger case next week um, okay. to address that question. Uh, uh, let me ask um, Mr. Zumbro. It seems to me that the issue is, do we have a prophylactic rule passed by Congress that says you can't do a divisional merger and then a bankruptcy? Or do we rely on the bankruptcy judge to decide when a divisional merger is in good faith and bad faith? Bad faith meaning to av avoid uh, your creditors. Senator, I think that's right. I think the bankruptcy courts are in much better position to evaluate those issues than Congress. I don't think uh, a, a law that flatly prohibits uh, a bankruptcy file, uh, filing after a divisional merger is appropriate or necessary. I did a divisional merger recently for a content uh, media company that needed to sell a content library. So uh, if that company that bought the content library, library needs to seek bankruptcy protection in 10 years, why should it be precluded from doing so? I, I think the courts can can make these determinations on a case-by-case -case basis. I understand. Could I ask, Mr. Chairman, for 30 more seconds, could you weigh in on that, Mr. McClain? Absolutely. Uh, first of all, what Mr. Uh, Skill said, what Professor Skill said, is not accurate in the Fourth Circuit. In the Fourth Circuit, where these bankruptcies are all originally filed, bad faith is not enough to dismiss the bankruptcy. A judge could find it's in complete bad faith. It, it's, a, it's a scheme. It's a fraud, but yet if, if the defendant, if the debtor can argue there's a reasonable likelihood of a successful reorganization, a standard which is almost impossible to meet, uh, then the bankruptcy has to stay. So dismissal is not an adequate remedy, even for bad faith under the law of the Fourth Circuit, where they, of course, file. Secondly, with respect to this prophylactic rule, think about the, the implications of what I've just said. Uh, the, the, the court's hands are bound. They're bound by this governing, controlling precedent. And it doesn't matter if it's bad faith. That's not enough. Uh, judges are, of course, faced with the cases in front of them, and they do their best, faced with the cases in front of them. But when there is such a, a widely used scheme where the wealthiest corporations go into bankruptcy to disadvantage some of their disfavored creditors, that is a universal problem that I would submit calls for a universal answer. Okay. Thank you all. Mr. Chairman, I have been asked by... Uh Professor Anthony Casey of the University of Chicago Law School, Law School and uh, Professor Parikh of the Lewis and Clark Law School to uh, offer statements on their behalf into the record. I have an objection. They'll be made part of the record. Thank you. I'm sorry to go over, Mr. Chair. No, nope, not a problem. Uh, Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations to all of you. I enjoyed hearing about and meeting some of your family members. Um, Ms. Morrison, which, which, uh, which branch of government uh, passes criminal statutes? Uh, the legislative branch. Yes, ma'am. Um, and legislators, of course, I think we can agree, are elected by the people. Um, do you think it would be fair to say that the people in our legislatures, legislators uh, define uh, criminality for our communities? 
That's correct, Senator. Okay. Do you think it's appropriate for a district attorney to decide uh, to ignore criminal statutes and not to prosecute an entire line of cases? Thank you, Senator, for that question. You're welcome. <laughs> um, district attorneys, as you know, are accountable to the people um, and the citizens who elect them. And I know it has become an issue in elections about the extent to which district attorneys will use the resources of their office to focus on particular yes, categories. And what do you think about that issue? Do you uh, think it's appropriate? Let me ask you again. Do you think it's appropriate for prosecutors to say, I disagree with the legislature and the people? and I'm not going to prosecute an entire line of cases. Um, Senator, I think it is appropriate for prosecutors to evaluate each case that comes before them and almost yes, every Yes, ma'am, but that's not what I'm asking. I know you, I mean, you're smart, okay? I can tell from your resume. Let me say it again. The people elect their legislators. Legislators say on behalf of the people, this is a crime which society will not tolerate without punishment. Do you think that it's okay for prosecutors to say, I disagree and I'm not going to prosecute an entire line of cases. I don't care who is charged. Do you agree with that? Um, Senator, I agree that prosecutors have the legal option to use the flexibility no, given but to them. when they exercise that option, do you agree with that? I think it would depend on the circumstance under which they're exercising it and, and what the rationale was for their Well, decision. what are the circumstances where it's okay to do that? Uh, so I think prosecutors in this country uh, work very difficult jobs under very demanding conditions. I, I'll stipulate to that. But we have prosecutors who are saying, to hell with the legislature and the people. We're not going to prosecute an entire line of cases. And I, I think my question is pretty straightforward. Do you agree with that or disagree with it? Um, Senator, I have never worked as a prosecutor. I have. Um, yes, ma'am, but, but you've read about it. Yes, What's going on? Do you agree with it or disagree with it? Uh, Senator, I, I, I think, I don't think I can give a categorical yes or no to that because I think I it think would depend on the I think you just answered my question. Uh, what do you think about the job being done by District Attorney Krasner? I believe you worked for the district attorney's re-election or, or election. Do you think he's doing a good job or a bad job? Uh, Senator, I did not actually work on District Attorney Krasner's campaign. I've been okay. an adversary of that office. I apologize. Office. Do you um, think he's doing a good job or a bad job? Um, uh, Senator, I don't think it would be appropriate as a judicial nominee for me to comment on the performance of a elected well, official. Why not? Uh, because there is always a chance that a case could come before me in which someone has, say, a prior conviction I'm, from Philadelphia who is then prosecuted in New York, and any commentary that I, I made on that office um, could be grounds uh, well, for Isn't, isn't that case. convenient? Um, do you think judges, apparently you think that prosecutors should be able to say, we're not going to prosecute a line of cases and, a, and a, 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 a group of crimes despite the solemn expression of a legislative will. Do you think judges should be able to do that? Say, I don't agree with this criminal statute. I'm not going to prosecute. Uh, I'm not going to hear cases for any of them. Uh, no, Senator. Judges do not prosecute cases. and, and I, I, I know that. But do you think a judge should say, I don't want to hear. I'm going to dismiss all these cases because I don't agree with the criminal statute. I think you understand my question, Ms. Morrison. I, I do, Senator, and, and, and I would... I'm trying to recall how you phrased the question. I would agree with you, uh, or at least my position would be that judges cannot refuse to adjudicate or hear a case uh, and ignore the will of the But district attorneys can. Uh, as executives, they are granted with greater discretion. For example, um, district attorneys day in and day out. A whole line of cases. Complaints, complaints from the police that they then evaluate based on the evidence. Do you think a district process. attorney, it's appropriate for a district attorney saying, look, in the name of, of uh, social justice, I'm not going to prosecute armed robberies anymore. You agree with that, um, Senator? I would I would stand on my previous answer. I think it would depend on the circumstance. I'm not aware of any district attorney in the country. How, that how can said, I vote for you if you won't answer a straightforward question like that, Counselor? Um, Senator, I I would hope that you would consider the entirety of my record and my qualifications and the work that the I've done. The problem is I have, 
And, and I see all these comments you've made in favor of the district attorneys who in the name of social justice, and you've, you, you've spoken glowingly of all of them, and now you won't answer my question about it. You say it's inappropriate. And I just don't, I think it's really appropriate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Morrison, you urge this committee to look at the whole of your record. I will confess the whole of your record is deeply disturbing. Across this country, Americans are horrified at skyrocketing crime rates, at skyrocketing homicide rates, at skyrocketing burglary rates, at skyrocketing carjacking rates. And all of those are the direct result of the policies you've spent your entire lifetime advocating. Thanks, you have Senator Whitehouse, uh, Senator Kennedy is next. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Judge, Councilman, congratulations. Um, Councilor, in about 60 seconds, because I only have five minutes, uh, could, could you tell me, in your opinion, what, if anything, is wrong with the criminal justice system in America? <laughs> Senator, oh. thank you for that very broad and very important question. You're welcome. Uh, I understand that there are numerous issues involving the criminal justice system that are the matter of vigorous debate in the public. Give, and me, two, give me two. Give me two things that you think are wrong with our criminal justice well, system. Senator, I, I truly respect the role of policymakers in considering questions like this. Uh, it involves so much study of, of empirical data. Yeah, counselor, I understand that. But give me two things. Maybe you don't think anything's wrong with it, but if you could give me two things you think, in your opinion, are wrong with our criminal justice system. Senator, in my, in my 12 and a half years of practice in post-conviction law, I have observed instances where individuals were denied uh, fundamental rights that, that were defined in the Bill of Rights. And uh, I, in many cases, have been able to assist those individuals in seeking vindication. Okay, let's move on, counsel. Um, do, do you think it's appropriate for a prosecutor to decide not to prosecute uh, certain classes or lines of criminal law violations in the name of social justice? Senator, I have not had the opportunity to review the legality of challenges to a, an executive's... I'm not, I'm not asking your opinion about the legality. Some of our DAs, you've read about them, I'm sure, um, in Philadelphia, Los Angeles, for example, other places, have said we, we are going to ignore criminal statutes passed by the legislature and not prosecute certain lines of cases in the interest of social justice. And I'm asking your opinion about that. Senator, I do not actually have a, an opinion about that per se. I, I do recognize that constituents. Uh, uh, Counselor, you've, you're an intelligent person. You spent your life in, in criminal, uh, involved in criminal law. You don't have an opinion? Have you thought about it? Senator, I. I'm not sure which specific instances of, of categories of crime that are not being prosecuted you're referring to. Sure. How about uh, shoplifting? How about receiving stolen property? How about resisting arrest? Uh, how about making criminal threats? Do you think those are all statutes, criminal violations? Do you think a prosecutor, it's a very simple question, counsel. Um, do you think prosecutors should decide in the name of social justice not to, to ignore these criminal violations? Have you thought about it? 
Senator, I, I can't say I have. You're telling me you've not given any thought to this? Senator, I... I None I, whatsoever. Thank you. I, no, sir, I don't believe you. I'm sorry. I just don't believe you. You're a well-read, intelligent person. And I don't know why you won't give me your opinion on this. Senator, I have focused on specific criminal cases uh, as as an advocate, as an appointed counsel. I know that, but I'm asking your opinion. I'm going to ask it one more time. Do you think prosecutors should ignore criminal violations as per statutes passed by a legislative body in the name of social justice as a matter of, of class of cases? All I can say, Senator, is I believe that prosecutors have a very important job. I, do. I agree. They, their job is enormously important. I'm just asking you to answer my question. I can't vote for you if you're not going to answer my question because I don't know what position you're going to take if you're on the court. Thank you, Senator. Would you, would you answer my question? I would hope that prosecutors would use all of, all of their tools and resources to make important decisions about issues such as the one that you've raised. And if confirmed, I would review the legality of any challenge. Counselor, I'm very disappointed. I'm getting more salad here, and I don't even have dressing on it. We both know what I'm talking about. And I, I think your, your refusal to answer, your refusal to answer gives, your refusal to answer gives me the answer with all due respect. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. Uh, I'm going to comment on that's your question. Well, I'm going to want to respond. I want you to. Okay. Attorneys and prosecutors make decisions every single day as to what cases will be prosecuted and which cases will not. It is physically, legally impossible to prosecute all cases. They establish priorities. They try to serve the public in establishing those priorities. Every prosecutor makes that choice. They can't prosecute every possible violation of the law. That's just part of their responsibility. I don't see why that is a reflection on whether or not you agree with their choices or not. Some are going to take a much different view than others. That's just the nature of it. And in terms of summarizing what's wrong with the criminal justice system in 60 seconds, challenge any one of us to do the same. Well, Mr. Chairman, you know... Dick, the affection that I have for you. But this is the third hearing in which you've made editorial comments about my questions. But I'm and the and floor so, open so, so I want to respond. <clears throat> um, number one, uh, this very bright person has spent her life in criminal just, the criminal justice system. I don't think it's unreasonable to ask what, if anything, she thinks is wrong with it and get a candid answer. Number two, of course you're right about prosecutorial discretion, but you and I both know that's not what my question was about. We have a number of district attorneys that have taken the position that they are going to ignore criminal statutes passed by a legislative body, and they are not going to prosecute, they meaning the prosecutors, an entire line of cases, for example, shoplifting, uh, receiving stolen property, resisting arrest in the name of social justice. Now, Mr. Chairman, you, we both know what I'm talking about, and so does the witness. And I don't know why she won't answer the question, and that's the point I was trying to make. I, I mean no disrespect to either of you, but I think my questions are perfectly appropriate in this environment. Thank you, Senator. Anything more to add at this point? Okay, thank you very much. I believe that Senator Blumenthal is next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Judge, Ms. Abudu, uh, congratulations. Um, I want to just talk to you, at least initially, a little bit about the law. Um, Ms. Abudu, what, what is the, uh, what's the adequate and independent state grounds doctrine? Thank you, Senator Kennedy. You're welcome. It in my practice, I actually haven't had an opportunity to use that principle or doctrine, but my general understanding is that it speaks to the fact that if a federal court is able to resolve an issue based on state law grounds, then that is what should lead in terms of the court's ultimate decision. Okay. 
What is the uh, selective incorporation doctrine? That also, in the voting rights or civil rights context, is a term that I haven't had to come across. But what I do know is that as a legal research and writer, mm -hmm. and for sure confronting possibly new areas of law, I look very forward to doing my due diligence in terms of making sure I'm familiar with doctrines such as that one. Do you know what it is? So no, I'm not familiar with it Selective sitting here today. Corporation. Right? Okay. Well, you're going to see a lot of it if you're confirmed on the 11th Circuit. Um, can Congress pa pass any law that the Constitution doesn't prohibit? Based on the frame of your question, I would say yes, that sounds right. So you think Congress has plenary power? Well, I would first look to what the Supreme Court has said in terms of following precedent. No, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested, if I could, uh, Counselor, in your opinion, is, is the United, does the United States Congress have delegated powers or plenary power? Well, the Congress has both, I would say, from my general understanding. Again, it depends on the context and the issue, but okay. it is. Can you explain the difference to me between strict scrutiny and intermediate scrutiny? Senator, strict scrutiny is the highest level of scrutiny that's often applied in constitutional right. cases. What's it the, requires. What's the I'm sorry, go ahead. Excuse me. So it requires that a state, when enacting a law or regulation, have a compelling governmental right. interest for doing so and that the law is narrowly tailored to achieve that interest. Okay. And then. Intermediate, did you say? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so intermediate yeah. speaks to the issue of having a substantial interest or uh, that is, or an important governmental interest that is substantially related. Okay. Um, do you believe that the meaning of the Constitution is immutable or does it change over time? Senator, I would say that the Supreme Court in some cases has analyzed that issue and the response really does depend on the context and the issue. But what the court does or has done in its approach, of course, is look to the plain meaning of, the, of a statute or of the Constitution because that really is where the inquiry should start. And if the language is plain, then that is where the inquiry can end. Okay, thank you for that. You, uh, you were involved in a 2021 report from the um, Southern Poverty Law Center about voting in Louisiana. Um, did you say, quote, racist white Southerners close quote, and quote, hostile white voters and governmental officials in Louisiana continue to make local polling places and early voting locations threatening spaces for black voters. Did you say that? Senator, I do not believe that I said that. I haven't read that publication in some time. Will you help time. write it? I helped to draft the publication and approved it, but I'm not familiar with that language. Oh, you don't? Okay. Uh, in that same report, did you say, well, t t tell me where in Louisiana uh, lo local polling places and early voting locations are threatening African American voters? You said it, so which polling places? So again, Senator, obviously I don't have that report in front of me to be able to read and remind myself of uh, the examples that might have been shared. But what I can say is that Louisiana... Well, let, me, let me cut you off because I'm going to run out of time, Counselor. Let me ask you one more. In August 2021, we're not talking 20 years ago, we're talking 2021, you were involved in another report by the SPLC and you said that voter identification, photo ID to vote, is burdensome and does not serve any legitimate state interest. Do you really believe that? Senator, identification for voting is yes, something... Yes, but first, do you really believe that? You said it. You meant it? 
the Supreme Court in Crawford v. Marion County has already upheld voter ID laws as per se. Yeah, yeah, but you said it didn't serve any legitimate state interest. Do you believe that? Again, Senator, without that language in front of me, it's hard to understand you the said context. It. Here it is, August 2021. Well, there are I, cases. I'm just asking you to explain to me why having to prove you are who you say you are before you vote doesn't serve, you said it doesn't serve any legitimate state interest. I'm just asking to explain that statement to me. I understand, Senator Kennedy, and again, without being able to see the language that appears before and after, it's hard for the context. You deny that you said it? I can't say that I, again, I haven't seen that language in front of me, but what I do know is that there have been voter ID cases in which courts have found yeah, but that I'm, it, I know, I'm, I'm familiar with the case law, but I'm asking what you think, because you may be on the 11th Circuit. Do you believe that voter ID it is, it, it, it is inappropriate? My commitment is to uphold the Supreme Court's decision in Crawford v. Mary I know, but County. here you said it was inappropriate. You deny that? Well, again, Senator, it? Senator, it would be it would be helpful to know if, if that section of the report also cites to cases in which federal courts have found that certain voter ID laws do pose an burden on voters. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. Senator Booker? Um, I'm going to yield to Senator Whitehouse, who's more Senator, senior. Seniority. Senator Whitehouse, more senior than Senator Booker. And more hair. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's no reason to yield. <laughs> that's a big group, Senator Booker. Let's, let's test them in the 40, though, and see who wins. <laughs> kind of a clean sweep of the committee. On something. We have a number of prosecutors who have chosen in the name of social justice not to prosecute uh, entire, an entire class of cases, despite, despite the fact that their legislature uh, has, has passed these criminal statutes. Do you think that's proper? Senator Kennedy, I, I think I can speak to that issue very broadly in the, the federal context, based on my experience as a prosecutor. I, I'm, I'm, I'm asking just in, in both contexts, state and federal, I'm asking your opinion on this conduct by some prosecutors? Well, uh, to phrase my opinion in constitutional terms, on, on the federal side, Article Two directs that the president shall take care that the laws are faithfully executed. Right. It's, it's long been recognized that there's a principle of prosecutorial discretion. Let me, let me stop you because I'm going to run out of time as I think you're aware. Do you agree with what these prosecutors are doing or do you disagree? Senator, I, I agree with the principle of prosecutorial discretion exercised in the interests of the United That's States. That's not what I'm asking, and we both know that, Counselor. Do you agree with what these prosecutors are doing, or do you disagree? Senator, I, I would have to get a little more detail uh, in order to opine on that. Are, are you afraid to give me an answer? Certainly not, and I'm happy to give you an okay. answer. Okay. Could you give me an answer, Ms. Padin? Do you agree with these prosecutors or, or as I described their conduct, do you disagree? Ju ju uh, thank you for that question, Senator. One would have to look at the position that the prosecutor is taking and I've, why I, they- I just explained it. Well, Some prosecutors have taken the position, despite the fact that their legislature has passed a criminal statute, that they're not going to prosecute uh, cases in violation of that statute. Do you agree with that or disagree with that? Senator, Senator, I can tell you that if a criminal matter appears before me, I would apply. I know you would, but I'm asking you your opinion on that prosecutorial uh, decision. But th that, that's an area that really falls within the executive part of government. Are you to afraid be able to give to address. me an answer? No, but I think it's a complicated answer. That, no, it's that, not. Do you agree or disagree? Senator, once again, I'm going to say that it's with the discretion of a prosecutor whether to prosecute okay. or not. The Ms. voters... Gordon, will you give me an answer? Senator, I am aware that prosecutors must act consistent with the 14th Amendment. Uh, that comes up in connection with selective prosecution. Yes, but do you agree example. with the prosecutors or disagree? I, I, Senator, I do not, sitting here today, have an opinion on that. It's outside the my practice and it is have not you thought about it I, I it is not anything that i have studied have you are you aware of the issue i am aware of the issue 
And do you agree with the prosecutors or disagree? Uh, Senator, I can tell you that I am aware this is hotly debated in the mainstream. Yes, and And, and, and I'm, I'm asking your opinion. Legislators, I, I know there are positions on both sides. I have not refined an opinion on that. Are you issue. afraid to give me your answer? No, Senator, I would give you an answer if I, I had uh, it, and I'm trying to. I'm doing my best to answer your question, but I, I do you not. You could have fooled me, Counselor. We both know what we're talking about here. I don't, I'm just at a loss why none of the three of you will give me an answer. It's very simple. Do you agree with the prosecutors or disagree? Are you going to give me an answer? I think I got my answer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Kennedy. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Merrill, I'm looking at a article you wrote in the breach in 2017 you said I'm gonna quote it's inconsistent to denounce white supremacy but not repudiate voter ID laws did you say that thank you for the questions senator You're welcome I believe that was an interview I gave in the days after Charlottesville, right. and I and I believe those statements were in turn. I was it was in my role as an advocate regarding my work uh, representing voters in Alabama challenging. So you them. didn't mean them as a person. I made them in my role as an advocate. Do you mean them as a person? I'm not asking you in your role as an advocate. Do you believe that if you're against white supremacy, you have to be against voter ID laws, Senator? In my role as an advocate, I have... Ma'am, I'm not asking you about... This wasn't the case. I'm asking you what you believe. And I don't appreciate you dodging my question. Now, this is, this is a serious position you've been nominated for. Do you believe that someone who is against white supremacy also has to be against voter ID laws? Senator, no. The Supreme Court has held that photo what ID... What do you believe? The, I believe that the Supreme Court has held what that What do you vote, believe personally? I believe that photo ID laws have been held to be constitutional. Do you think voter ID laws are appropriate or inappropriate? I believe those are, are questions that uh, election officials... Uh, do you think, believe that voter ID laws are appropriate or inappropriate? I believe that photo ID laws have been held to be constitutional. I believe there are cases in which what they are... What do you believe? I believe there are cases in which they are appropriate. What do you believe? I also believe there are cases what do you in believe? which they can. What do you believe? Do you Senator, believe? let her answer, please. I'm trying to. I'm trying to. We both know what's Needs going on, this, Mr. Chairman. Let her complete the why, sentence. Why, well, let me do my own questioning, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your help, Professor. Um, do you believe that voter IDs laws are appropriate or not? I believe there are circumstances where photo ID laws can be constitutionally implemented. And I believe that the Supreme Court has also held that there are circumstances when they would not be constitutionally permitted. Okay. All right, Ms. Uh, Ms. Choudhury, are you saying your name right? It is Choudhury. Choudhury, thank you for correcting me. Thank you. Uh, in 2015, you were on a panel at Princeton University. Um, you said that uh, the killing of unarmed black men by police happens every day in America. Did you say that? Senator, I don't recall a statement, but it is something I may have said in that context. You, you think it happens every single day? Senator, I believe in that in that statement, I was making a comment in my role as an advocate, and I was engaging in rhetorical advocacy, which But do, do you believe that police officers kill unarmed black men every day in America? Senator, I believe the killing of unarmed citizens by law enforcement is tragic, and I believe in that I, instance I think it's I tragic, was, too, but do you believe, uh, this is a really simple question, Counselor, do you believe that cops kill unarmed black men in America every single day. You said it at Princeton. 
Senator, I said it in my role as an advocate. Oh, okay. You didn't mean it. Senator, I said it in my role as an advocate to make a rhetorical point. So, so when you say something that's, that's incorrect, it's okay to excuse it by saying, oh, I was being an advocate? What do you believe? Do you personally believe that cops kill unarmed black men every single day in America? Senator, I believe law enforcement have an important and challenging job in this country. That's not what you said, though, Counselor. Senator, I say before you here today that I do believe law enforcement have a difficult and challenging job, and I also understand the difference between... I just between think that's an extraordinary statement to make with no data to back up. No, none whatsoever. There's no basis for you saying that. And you knew it then and you know it now. How can someone possibly believe that you're going to be unbiased on the federal bench? Senator, I believe my record shows that I have worked collaboratively with law enforcement in Boston, Chicago, Mississippi, and Milwaukee to solve complex problems to promote constitutional, effective, and Your safe Your record policing. shows that you believe cops are guilty until proven innocent. Your record shows that if a cop, if, 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 if a uh, cop shoots a criminal, it's the cop's fault. And if a criminal shoots a cop, it's the gun's fault. I've read your record. I've read your record, Ms. Murrow, and I don't appreciate you not answering the question straight up. I would respect you a lot more if you'd just tell us what you believe and not try to hide it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Booker. So glad to have Thank these you. experts with us. Senator Kennedy. Mr. Rowe, um, what do you propose? Is it Rowan or I can't see that? Yes, Rowan. I'm sorry. Yes, it's Rowan. Uh, what do you, what do you your, your employees have trouble finding affordable child care? That's correct. What do you think we ought to do about the problem? Well, as I said uh, in my uh, introductory opening, there have been solutions over the years. My mother was involved in an organization that uh, created a, a nonprofit. Uh, child care operation. It uh, it re uh, worked on pay by uh, uh, by need. Um, it did have a uh, um, it used um, funds from the United Way, which were um, you know charitable funds. But I also believe that um, um, it needs more government funding to keep the the economic model for. As, um, okay. as you, you think, was you think the American taxpayer needs to subsidize child care? I believe, if correctly explained, the American taxpayer would understand that an investment by the government in good child care would dramatically improve the economic condition of all of our small businesses and corporate businesses right. to the point where we would have a bigger, larger workforce, mm -hmm. which would be more productive, more stable, um, and everybody would benefit. So the value of the investment, as a business owner, I understand investment. The value of that investment would be far greater than the cost of it today. And if explained properly how, how many, to the many, American I, public, I they would understand. How many employees do you have? I run between 50 and 75 to 85. Okay. What does a starting employee make in your company? Two years ago, $9 an hour. Today, about $12 an hour. Minimum wage in Pennsylvania is $7.25. So the starting pay for, for a person in your company today, when they walk is $12 in, $12 an hour. That's what I have to be paying to get somebody. Well, of course to they can't afford health care. I mean, uh, child care. Um, are you insinuating I'm paying How much too money did you take out of your company last year? What was your salary? Um, my personal salary was $100,000. Okay. Did you take out in, any money? In, are you an LLC? I'm a subchapter S corporate. Okay, you're a sub yes. S. So yes. you took out, some, in addition to your salary, you, you, you had to pay taxes. So presumably you, you took out profits. How much did you take out there? My company lost over three hundred thousand dollars last year. Okay, so your total take from your company was a hundred thousand dollars. Actually, my total take, because as a subchapter S, my business income is my income. Right, was negative two hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so you had a is that a is that aberrational or is that 
I hope so. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yes, I, it is. Pre pandemic, how much did you take out? My um, my average over, say, a 25 year period of time for my company mm -hmm. um, has been somewhere between the profit for the company that is then we pay taxes on right. has been somewhere between 45,000 and maybe 150 to 200,000. OK, well, look, I'm not trying to pick on you and, and congratulations on having a family business. Let me let me just uh, give you this point of view. <clears throat> of course, child care is too expensive. Um, everybody up here wants less expensive child care. Mm -hmm. Everybody up here is supports children in prosperity, too. Mm -hmm. Now, here's a rational way to go about it. It's probably not the way Congress will go about it, but it's <laughs> a rational way. Um, there's some things you can't quantify. You, you you can't quantify the self the the the, uh, the self well being of having a job. I don't care how much mon money government gives you. Mm -hmm. you. You can't quantify the feeling of self worth that a person receives from being gainfully employed and supporting his or her family and being a meaningful part of his community. Follow me here. Senator, I would like to add one thing. Sure. I've been in my business for over 45 years. I'm in a small business community. I know every one of my employees, and I can quantify with them, when I look them in the eye, what a good job means. Right. And I watch them cry when they can't come to work because they don't have child care. I understand. Um, so there's a part of this you can't quantify, in my opinion. I the the, the I meant what I said earlier, a person without a job is not healthy, that person is not happy, and that person is not free. And, yeah, government can give you a cell phone, but you're going to feel much better about yourself if you earn the money to buy a cell phone. Okay? There is a part of this you can quantify. A rational approach, therefore, would be to say, okay, if government subsidized the cost of child care in America, what would that mean in terms of GDP? How many additional people would go to work? Um, how many fewer lost <laughs> my child is sick days would we have in America? What would be the impact on productivity? All that can be quantified. And you take that number, the cost, or, or the benefit rather, and you compare it to the cost. And if the benefit substantially outweighs the cost, you would go forward. The question would then become, how do you pay for it? Well, if we say this is a priority, a meaningful place to start, if you respect taxpayer dollars, and we all do, is to say, okay, we're going to comb through our budget. We're going to basically scrub our budget before we just go borrow more money and try to find out what in our current budget is a lower priority than, than, uh, than affordable child care. We never do that. Mm -hmm. We never do that. I, I, I mean, we just don't do that. Neither side does that. It, when we put together a budget, Mr. Bowen, we don't do it like you do at your, your business. <laughs> Our fight over a budget is how much mo extra money we're going to give to the bureaucracy every year. We don't have any metrics. In the real world, um, if you're doing a lousy job, you get fired. In government, if you're doing a lousy job, it must mean that you don't have enough money. So we give you more money. That's the way it works. I mean, let me just finish my thought. So that would be a rational play. And then once we really try to scrub the budget and find the money, then if it's not enough, given our other competing priorities, we could talk about, well, is this something that we ought to add on an operating, as an operating expense and borrow money? That would be a, a, a rational way. But that's not what is before us. What is before us, let me just take the president's Build Back Better plan. 
You know what the child care provisions and that would cost? $75 billion a year. What do you think that's going to do to inflation? And that's not $75 billion that we should, could find by scrubbing the budget. That'll, that's not touching the budget. Nobody wants to touch the budget. We just want to add to it. We don't have you to have 5% of $75 billion. We've got to go borrow that. Do you see the problem? I don't think anybody has, at least I don't have, a problem with the end result, with the objective here. But the answer is not just to say, oh, okay, we'll just add $75 billion a year extra to our operating account based on the assumption that all the money we're spending right now is well spent, and yeah, we'll just borrow more. That's not the answer. And it wasn't the answer before inflation, but let me tell you what will happen right now if we if we go past Bill Back Better. And there's some good things in Bill Back Better. You know the impact of that on inflation? You think 8.5% inflation is high? Get ready for 15% inflation. And that's the problem. Anyway, that's the end of my speech. You, you mentioned that in a small, or in business, we don't do things like government. Um, and that's very true. Um, I might have lost money last year, but then make a decision this year to spend $50,000 on a piece of equipment that I can't afford, so I have to borrow for it. But I know that that $50,000 worth of equipment will make $300,000 worth of equipment or uh, products that I will make $50,000 in profit. So I will pay for that piece of equipment in one year and then own that equipment for 10 years and make $50,000 every year after that. So I make $500,000 because I make an investment that is the correct one at the right time. It's not... I bet you one of the first thing you do, though, is you don't just assume that you need to go borrow the money to, to buy that equipment. The first thing you do is sit down with your operating budget and see if you can't find a... a, a uh, a place to cut. That's the first thing you do. We do that all the time. Absolutely. Well, I agree with you. We and don't. <laughs> we don't. And that's the problem. Thank you. Senator Reed. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Calagroso, uh, we're looking at a situation where uh, Child care is extraordinarily expensive uh, for everybody. Uh, uh, and the irony is that the child care workers were only making uh, minimum wage or sometimes slightly above. Uh, let me ask each of you this, because I consider all of you students of the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, what do you think will, will be the impact on the United States Supreme Court and people's respect for it? as a result of this leak about the draft opinion in the Mississippi abortion case. We'll start on this end, and then I'll let Professor Payne rest a minute. It was already on. You know, it's an empirical question. I really couldn't say. I think that the... Um, the, the leak, the, the substance of the leak, which shows that the court is going against the majority of the country, is much more damaging to the legitimacy than the leak itself. Thank you, Professor. Well, the leak last night is obviously outrageous and should be taken very seriously, but I have a lot of confidence in the court and the American public, and I think that the Supreme Court is going to rise above the circumstance and, as it's done for decades, apply the rule of law and issue a decision that it believes reflects the uh, constitutional principles in the Dobbs case and, and all others and trust that the Chief Justice and the court will be able to um, resolve and issue an, an honest opinion uh, quickly. Okay. Professor Frost. I think the leak was uh, unethical, but I do not think it will damage the court. And I think far more damaging to the court was the failure to fill a seat for nearly a year um, when uh, a nominee by then President Obama was pending and not acted upon. Okay. Professor, you're a professor too. Thank you. I think the leak was seismic, devastating, and heartbreaking. It should go without saying that 
The Supreme Court can fulfill its Article III responsibility if drafts of opinions are leaked and circulated for what appear to be political purposes. That said, I do think the Supreme Court is fully capable of keeping its eye on the ball and deciding this case ultimately through a final official published opinion in the way that the law and the Constitution command. Professor Payne. Uh, I think the leak was highly inappropriate, and it also raises the question of what are the specific rules that apply to the uh, officials and the employees in the Supreme Court because it's not clear about their duty of confidentiality as opposed to the duty of confidentiality for all of the other clerks across the uh, lower courts. Okay, thanks to you all. So we have a, uh, as people arrive and step out, we have a new list, a uh, new order of proceeding, which is uh, Senator Blumenthal, Senator Graham, Senator That answer Durf. took me a little bit over it, so I apologize Sorry. to my colleagues, Senator Kennedy. That's okay, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, I'm, I, I've enjoyed your testimony. <clears throat> um, Professor Frost, I take it that you think the, uh, the recusal provisions that the United States Supreme Court uses are inadequate. I'm, I'm interested in, in learning more about that. Um, do, do you think they undermine, they meaning the recusal provisions at the United States Supreme Court, undermine the integrity of the court? I do, and I think that what is unfortunate is there's some easy ways to fix and change this, which of course is, is in Congress's hands um, by adding procedures to the recusal statute. Right. Let me ask you, what do you think undermines the integrity of the United States Supreme Court more in your judgment? Um, it's recusal provisions or a member of the United States Senate going to the steps of the Supreme Court and threatening justices by name if they don't rule the way he wants on Roe v. Wade. So I take it that this hearing is to consider a bill and to consider possible legislative reform to improving the way the court operates and protecting actually all the Article III courts. So that's going to be the focus of my testimony. And here's what this institution could yes, do. Yes, ma'am, but first, could you answer my question? So your question is whether people speaking out against the court is more damaging to no, the court? No, my question. My question is, what do you think undermines the integrity of the United States Supreme Court, the inadequacy, in your opinion, of its recusal provisions or having a member of the United States Senate go on the steps of the United States Supreme Court in front of God and country and threaten justices by name if they do not vote the way he wants them to vote on Roe v. Wade. So, Senator, Unfortunately, over the last decade, particularly the last five years or so, I have seen the court come under attack from so many different sources. Yes, ma'am, but what about that particular? That, I think that's a problem. I would certainly not support a senator criticizing the court. It's also a problem when the Senate of the United States will not confirm a nominee for over a year, leaving the court at eight justices. And it's also a problem when Congress will not amend existing legislation to improve the process of recusal so that all of the justices can weigh in on a recusal decision right. and protect the integrity of that court. All of those are a problem. Let me ask each of you this. You're all students. Well, first, I'm going to call you professor anyway. I think you're qualified to be a professor. Professor Payne, you mentioned uh, ethical misconduct. I'm sorry, ethical misconduct by the United States Supreme Court justices. Can you give me examples in the last 20 years of specific acts of ethical misconduct by the United States Supreme Court justices? I can definitely send you the allegations of misconduct. And in, in the Supreme Court, the perception of misconduct has the same impact as actual yeah. misconduct. But, but I'm asking for actual acts of misconduct. Because there's no body to make the legal decision whether something is actual misconduct, I can't point to a decision that's been made. I can only give you the allegations of the potential misconduct, which includes uh, failure to recuse and improper travel. Okay. I'm not going to ask you 
your opinion on precedent, and I'm not going to really ask you about past cases. I just want to talk to you a little bit. Um, Judge Lee, t tell me what your understanding is uh, currently of the Chevron doctrine. Thank you, Senator Kennedy, for that question. My understanding currently of the Chevron doctrine is that um, the doctrine is a general matter that courts should give deference to agency factual determinations to the extent that the agency has been empowered by Congress to regulate certain areas. How much deference have, have the, have the uh, appellate court said you should give? Explain what you mean by giving them I know what deference is, but do you give them a lot of deference? What if they come up with, a, with, with an interpretation that is patently absurd? Do you have to defer to that? Thank you, Senator Kennedy. Um, you know, Senator Kennedy, I know that the issue of um, the Chevron doctrine and the deference that courts should afford to agencies is an issue that is currently hotly uh, contested in various litigation. And as a sitting district judge and as a nominee for the Seventh Circuit, I feel that it would be imprudent to provide uh, my advisory views with regard I, I, to that I, issue. Look, I agree with you, Judge. I'm not asking your advisory view. I'm asking you to tell me what the law is. What's the current state of the law? I agree with you. Um, under Chevron, the courts have said um, Congress has delegated this, this expertise to the regular agencies. You're supposed to t defer to them. What is the current state about how much deference and when, if ever, you don't defer to them? That's all I'm asking. Um, again, Senator Kennedy, uh, given how um, hotly contested that issue is, uh, I feel that at this point in time, um, as a sitting district judge and as a nominee to the Seventh Circuit, that uh, judge, let me interrupt you. You're yes. telling me you can't tell me what the state of you won't tell me what the state of the law is on the Chevron doctrine. I'm not asking your opinion on it. I'm just telling me what's the latest guidance. Let me rephrase it. What is the latest guidance that the United States Supreme Court has given us on the Chevron doctrine? I mean, it's pretty important stuff. Yes, Senator. The uh, Chevron doctrine, as I stated, was that uh, the court should give deference to um, agency determinations in matters that specifically deal with their um, particular uh, realm that right. Congress has delegated. We went over that. How much deference? When, when do you not defer to the agencies? The, uh, as I recall, Senator, the... Um, the degree of deference that a court should afford agencies really deals with the uh, process that the agency went through in making its determination, as well as to the exact and precise nature of that determination. Yeah, I don't agree with that, Judge, but that's okay. Um, I'm surprised you haven't seen the issue of Chevron before. You're going to see it on the Court of Appeals. It's pretty important stuff. Judge... Mendoza, one question. I've only got a little bit of time left. Look, you wrote an a, 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 a law review article back in law school, and I don't hold that against you. You know, when I was in law school, uh, we all did things when we were young that, you know, it seemed like a good idea at the time, okay? But you, but you made, if I got this wrong, tell me. But you made one statement. I was looking at your, your, uh, your piece. I think this came from your article. Here's, I'm going to read you the quote, and I just didn't understand it. One, here's your quote. One must understand race as a socially constructed phenomenon that has, has historically served to subordinate racial minority groups while maintaining white supremacy. I've never thought of race as a socially constructed phenomenon. Tell me what you meant by that statement. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Senator, for that question. And I think you're referring to that article that I wrote 26 years ago yeah. when I was a, when I was a, a law student. 
And of course, since that time, uh, Senator, I've uh, became an attorney. Uh, I swore an oath. Uh, uh, at that point, I became a judge. In no, I'm not trying to trip you up. I'm just trying to understand what you meant by it. When I first read it, I said, well, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting construct. I just don't understand it. And, and, and Senator, I, as I sit here now, I, I can't recall that specific quote. But what I can tell you is when I deal with the issue of race in my court, it's yeah. usually in a claim. And, and what I do in those claims is I apply the, uh, uh, the precedent on the matter. I look at the facts and I make those determinations and base my decision only on those issues and nothing else. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Congratulations. Thanks, Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Maldonado, did I say that right? Yes, thank you, Senator. Okay, you're a, you're a, a, a key TAM lawyer? I have um, litigated key TAM cases, right. yes. cool. You're also a yoga instructor? I am, Senator. Double cool. <laughs> thank uh, you. Are going to keep teaching if you're on the bench? or You teach, don't you? I, I teach. I actually was, um, one judge is currently sitting suggested that I do a class for judges. Oh. The judge's gym. Oh, great. <laughs> um, Mr. Williams, tell me about the privileges or immunities clause. Uh, thank you for the uh, question, uh, uh, Senator. Uh, the uh, privileges and, community and uh, uh, immunities clause. Privileges uh, are immunities clause. Right. Uh, uh, that's uh, part of the uh, 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 Bill of Rights and part of the... Uh, uh, I believe the First Amendment. Uh, it's it's been a while, Senator. That my my practice is uh, primarily intellectual property, uh, so um, uh, it's been a while since uh, I've faced an issue uh, with the privilege and immunity. Um, Mr. Williams, tell me about the privileges or immunities clause. Uh, th thank you for the uh, question, uh, uh, Senator. Uh, the uh, privileges and community and, uh, uh, immunities clause. Privileges uh, are immunities clause. Right. Uh, uh, that's uh, part of the uh, 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 Bill of Rights and part of the, uh, uh, I believe, the First Amendment. Uh, it's it's been a while, Senator. That my my practice is uh, primarily intellectual property, uh, so. Um, uh, it's been a while since uh, I've faced an issue uh, with the privilege and immunity clause. It doesn't come up every day in my the practice. Privileges are immunity. Privileges or, or immunity clause doesn't come up every day in my practice. What right. I can tell you that if I was faced with an issue uh, uh, that involved the privilege or immunities clause, I would uh, review the binding Supreme Court precedent on the issue and uh, apply uh, that binding precedent to the specific facts of the case in front of me. Okay, tell me what rights are guaranteed by the Sixth Amendment. Uh, Sixth Amendment uh, uh, guarantees uh, uh, right to uh, uh, right uh, to a speedy trial. Right. Uh, right uh, uh, to counsel. Right. Uh, and uh, also. Uh, uh, Right to speedy, uh, right to counsel, and also, uh, uh, that's the fifth, right uh, against uh, self-incrimination, which is in the Fifth Amendment. Okay. Tell me what the holding was in Obergefell. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. The, uh, the, the holding in Obergefell v. Hodges. Uh, Senator, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I haven't uh, had the occasion to... Uh, deal with that issue. Uh, I don't recall that specific case as I sit here uh, uh, in front of you. But what I can tell you is that if the issue decided in that case uh, came before me, I would uh, review uh, binding Supreme Court precedent and apply it to the specific facts of the case in front of me. Okay. Um, in 2015, Mr. Williams, you gave a speech and you said that the modern judicial system today is more racist than it was 100 years ago. Did you say that? Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. You're welcome. Uh, uh, I don't believe that's the uh, specific quote that I said. 
Uh, I believe you're referring well, let me, to. Let me, let me read you the quote so there won't be any misunderstanding. Becoming a felon is more devastating today than when existed during Jim Pro, Jim Crow. And you were you were talking about the uh, judicial system uh, in Delaware. Thank you for the question, Senator. You're welcome. I made those comments as uh, co-chair of the Access to Justice Commission, which was a commission that was created by the Delaware Supreme Court. Yes, sir. But, uh, that but I was asked. Tell to, me what the, you meant. The chair. I, I know. So, what, I read the uh, uh, the interview. I, tell me what you meant. I was referring to. Uh, a description uh, that uh, others uh, have made uh, to describe the condition of felons in terms of uh, the term Jim Crow, meaning... Well, well, let, me, let me stop you. Do you believe that the judicial system in Delaware in America is more racist today than it was 100 years ago? Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. Uh, uh, no, I do not believe that the system today is more racist than it was 100 years ago. Uh, what I was describing well, was the... Uh, well, but, but why did you say becoming a felon is more devastating today than when it existed during Jim Crow? Uh, I was referring to the conditions of, of, of the inordinate uh, amount of people of color who, when they become felons, uh, are, are faced with loss of economic opportunity, uh, loss of voting rights, uh, loss of driving license, loss but of But that happens housing. to an Hispanic How, as well, right? Uh, it happens to... If you're convicted. It, it happens to everyone who becomes a felon, but the, 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 the task of the committee was to examine... Uh, the reasons why there are such glaring racial disparities in the population of people of color in Delaware as compared to and you the think population you, you think of, that's of because people of racism? incarcerated. You think that's because of racism? Uh, I did not uh, say. Uh, my, I, I know. I'm that, asking you, do you think that's because of racism? I believe that uh, race plays a factor. In uh, Delaware? Uh, 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 across in 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 across uh, the in Delaware and beyond, uh, and that uh, uh, studies have shown that uh, uh, there is a uh, disparity uh, in the prison population that just can't be explained by. Uh, just nature and it be coincidence and that race plays some factor. It's not the only factor. Right. Uh, economic uh, condition, money, ability to pay bail, et cetera, plays a factor and some other things play a factor. Uh, so at that time, I was serving as right, well, chair. Let me stop you because my, my chairman here has been very, very uh, uh, indulgent. I'm going to ask you one last question. Um, do, do you think... Uh, uh, Photo IDs, requiring a photo ID to vote is in inappropriate? Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. You're welcome. Uh, the Supreme Court has held that uh, voter IDs right. uh, requirement for voting what do you per think? is permissible. What do you think? Uh, I, Senator, uh, follow binding Supreme Court precedent. Yeah, uh, but what do you think? Uh, you, you've written articles saying that, that that's racist, haven't you? I have not. Okay. I have not. Well, you've went, written articles opposing voter ID, have you not? I have not. Okay. So you think it's okay? I do. Okay. That's all I got. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for your indulgence. Of course. Um, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, professor, uh, what did you think about the leak of the draft opinion at the Supreme Court? Senator, I thought it was horrible. I thought it was a huge breach of confidence and uh, the inner workings of the Supreme Court and of an institution that having had the, the honor of being able to clerk at that I, that I really admire. I was, I was really dismayed to hear about the leak. Yeah, that was pretty incredible. Um, what limitations 
on free speech. Can the owner of a public shopping center place on its patrons? Senator, um, this is not something that I've had experience in my career arguing cases um, throughout the country on. I know, but I, I, just want you, I just want your thoughts. You're a Supreme Court clerk and you've got extraordinary credentials. Mm -hmm. Give me uh, your thoughts. Help me analyze. Well, one of my first thoughts, um, Senator, is these cases about um, First Amendment and whether um, there is uh, seen to be a public forum somewhere are entirely uh, context dependent. You really need to dig into the record um, in the case and see which precedents it lines up to mm -hmm. most and then figure it out that way without having kind of a general idea of, of whether it would always be okay. Well, what are, the, in what okay. are the interests that you have to balance? Um, Senator, our um, Constitution, of course, protects um, a right to speech, and that's very important to our country. And you also have the rights of a property owner um, in that case. And um, again, you would need to look at the particular context and the applicable precedents that match up most closely with that context in order to make any determination. Okay. Let me ask you about uh, you, you're in private practice. You represent a group called uh, Every Town for Gun Safety. Um, they have been co-counsel in some of my cases, yeah. Senator. Okay. Well, look, I, I, I don't think it's fair to blame uh, to, to impute uh, to attorneys all the the uh, the uh, values of their clients. I mean, I think everybody has a right to counsel. Uh, as I've said before in this committee, I've had I've had clients that uh, I didn't agree with. I've had clients I didn't even like. Uh, do, do, but but I'm human. You're human. We have personal opinions. Do you agree with the the positions of uh, every town for gun safety, Senator? Um I'm not familiar with all of the positions of every town for gun safety. I'm happy to talk well, about, about my... Well, how about One of them is uh, uh, every town for gun safety, uh, your client, says a ban, ban assault weapons. You agree, personally, do you agree with that? Um, Senator, um, as a mom and someone who cares about gun violence, I think these issues are very important to discuss. I know. That's why I'm asking you. Do you <laughs> yeah. agree with them? You, you know, agree we should ban assault weapons? I think these are questions that um, policymakers, whether it's um, this body who I know yeah, but is Yeah, I'm just asking on... what you believe. I mean, I, 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 please don't dodge my question. You're, you're, you're a bright person. I know you've thought about it. Just tell me what you, I'll, tell me what you believe. Do you believe we should ban, we should ban assault weapons? I believe, Senator, that um, as a nominee to the federal bench, um, it'd be inappropriate for me to express oh, I don't. any I personal. Think I don't understand that you certainly you have personal beliefs and values. I don't want you not, not to have personal beliefs and values. If you haven't thought about this stuff, you're not qualified. Um, so let me ask you again: Do you do you? It's just a simple question. Do you think we ought to ban assault weapons, uh, Senator? If any case about gun regulation were to come before me if I'm fortunate why, to be confirmed. Why are confirmed. you just afraid to say you do? Um, Senator, I'm bound by the code of judicial ethics. No, you're not. Even you're not a judge. To, I wouldn't want any of... You're not a judge. You're a professor. Uh, Senator, I, I do very much enjoy teaching um, my law students and, and being a professor, but... As a nominee, so I have to be careful about... So you're not going to tell me about, you agree with banning assault weapons? Senator, I don't think it's appropriate to comment on policy issues, particularly policy issues that could come before a court if I am uh, fortunate to be confirmed. It's going to be hard to vote for you, Counselor, if you won't tell me what, you, what your values are. Okay? I, I, I play poker with a lot of friends every now and then, and I trust them, but I always cut the cards. I'm not saying I don't trust you, but if you won't tell me what your values are, it's going to be hard to vote for you. And, and I, I, don't, I don't think it furthers this process for you to dodge. I just don't. Thank you, Senator. Senator Booker. 
thank you both for being before us today. Uh, Ms. Blumenkratz, my uh, questions are going to really be for you. Uh, so you live in Guatemala, or you were teaching Guatemalans. I couldn't get it right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Garcia, uh, how old are you? Senator, I'm 36. Okay. And um, <clears throat> you're now at the Department of Justice. You were at O'Melveny and Myers. That's correct. You were a partner there? Yes, sir. How many partners um, are there at O'Melveny? Now, it's a great law firm. Um, my guess would be between uh, 100, around 150. Yeah. Okay. Um, g given, given your age and, and your experience, um, are there any partners at O'Melveny and Myers that have more experience that you think would, would make a better addition to our courts of appeal? Are you the very best that O'Melveny has to offer? Senator, O'Melveny and Myers has many incredible, incredible attorneys. Agreed. Uh, and I, I would uh, certainly hope to just be judged on my own record. I am. I, I'm just yeah. Well, let's, let's move on. I want to understand... Uh, I want to understand your record. You've done a lot of pro bono case cases. The June Medical Services case, was that a pro bono case? Uh, yes, Senator, I believe so. Okay, so, so that means you weren't paid. The firm wasn't paid. That's correct. You just chose to do it. The, the firm was not paid. As an attorney, I, I would have been compensated uh, for my time. Yeah, but yes. the firm wasn't paid. That's correct. Senator. So you didn't have to do it to eat? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> And in June Medical Services, that was a Louisiana case, you argued that a doctor should not have to have admitting privileges at a, at a hospital in order to uh, perform an abortion. You said that was unconstitutional. Is that under my understanding uh, correct? Senator, that case was unique because just four years earlier, the Supreme Court yeah, had held a very similar... Yeah, but my understanding of that case right, Counselor? Uh, yes, that's correct. Our clients okay. argued that that uh, right, law was unconstitutional. Let me ask you this. The New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus City of New York. You represented the City of New York. Was that a pro bono case? Uh, yes, Senator, it was. Okay, so you didn't have to do it to eat. You chose to do it. At a large law firm, Senator, if you're asked to work on a case, um, in my experience, unless I was too busy, I, I believe I always said yes. Yeah, but you were a star at Melvody. I mean, you were a Supreme Court clerk. You can pick and choose your cases. Um, all right, and in that case, you argued that um, a gun owner in New York City could own a gun in his home, but he couldn't take it, or she couldn't take it outside their home, including to a shooting range. Is that right? Senator, it's actually a little bit different. Uh, uh, individuals could take their firearms to uh, training ranges in the city, uh, but that case actually focused on a doctrine of mootness. Yeah, but you, you supported the New York's position to restrict the ownership of guns, is that correct? Uh, Senator, that case, uh, certainly New York City was our client. Okay. There was a regulation on premises licenses and where right. folks could train with them. Right, I think most people know what the case is, Counselor. Uh, now, you, the Our Lady of Guadalupe School v. Morrissey was another case you handled against Catholic elementary schools. Was that a pro bono case? Uh, yes, Senator, I believe so. So you didn't have to, that you weren't paid. You didn't have to do it to eat. You chose to do it. Similar to before, uh, I enjoyed litigating complex cases, especially in the Supreme Court, so I would have agreed right. uh, when I was asked. And so you were arguing against um, the, the uh, strike that. You, you were arguing against the Catholic elementary schools and against at least from their point of view, their religious freedom. Is that correct? Uh, I think that's fair, Senator. We, our firm represented the plaintiffs okay. in those cases. All right. I got 45 seconds left, Counselor, and I wanted to ask Judge Douglas a question, but I don't know if I'm going to have time. Uh, she says it's okay. Um, we, we, we've had a, a circumstance in America where we have uh, prosecutors who have chosen not to prosecute an entire line of cases, not to exercise prosecutorial discretion, but just to say, even though the legislature passed a statute saying, let's say, shoplifting 
uh, of any amount but under $950 is a crime. The, uh, certain prosecutors have said, I, I just don't believe that's right. I'm not going to prosecute uh, those cases. And they have taken it on themselves. What, do you, what is your opinion of that? Thank you, Senator. I think those types, types of decisions are, are very important for prosecutors to make carefully. And as you suggested... What's your opinion? Are they right or wrong? Well, Senator, as a judicial nominee, um, what I could commit is that if a case involving uh, questions yeah, like that... What's your opinion? Are they right or wrong? Well, Senator, in the abstract, I think every executive branch, the president, has a constitutional duty to Do take care of the... Do you have an opinion, counselor? As a uh, senator, as have a judicial you nominee... About it? It is absolutely an important issue. In fact, the Supreme Court... Have you Court, thought about it? The Supreme Court I'm just... I'm running out of time. Have you thought about it? Uh, I have actually not worked on a case relating to that. So you have no opinion about what's going on all across America in terms of prosecutors not prosecuting criminals. You're well, telling me that. A Sen Supreme Court clerk for Justice Kagan. Senator, I... Senator Melvin E. Myers. You're telling me you haven't thought about that? Oh, that's not what I'm saying at all, Senator. Okay. I, what I'm saying Tell is... Tell me your opinion. Uh, I, I hope you'll appreciate that the code of judicial You're not going conduct. To give you your opinion, are you, uh, Senator? My my opinion is that I'm those done. are important Thank questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> so, uh, several senators have come and gone on the Republican side. I believe the, the first senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations to all of our nominees. I want to start with the judge. Uh, judge, in terms of the powers given to the various branches of government. Uh, it is the uh, U.S. Constitution a doctrine of plenary powers or enumerated powers? Thank you, Senator, for your question. You're welcome. Congress has afforded enumerated powers uh, in the Constitution, not plenary powers. Okay. Um, counsel, we know that the 14th Amendment requires states to afford equal protection of the law to its citizens. But it only applies to the states. What provision of the federal constitution requires the federal government to afford equal protection? Well, the, the, uh, the, the 14th Amendment, um, as well as uh, the, the Fifth Amendment also, guarantee due process to all citizens, um, the federal process and or state, and, uh, and as well, um, under the, uh, I think, the 14th Amendment also, uh, the, uh, the, the federal government is bound by the 14th Amendment of the federal constitution. So it also uh, would bind um, the, uh, the federal entities. Okay. Um, counselor, what is the difference between the Privileges and Immunities Clause and the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the Constitutions? Thank you, Senator. The Privileges and Immunities Clause in the Constitution uh, prevents states from discriminating against uh, citizens of other states. Um, and then the Privileges or Immunities Clause in the 14th Amendment uh, prevents states from uh, uh, disparaging or uh, discriminating against citizens in their federal rights. Okay. Um Mr. DeZeno, did I say that your name right? Yes, sir. Please don't be offended, but I'm not about to mess with one of Senator Grassley's nominees, okay? <laughs> so let me start and go back that way. Uh, counselor, I've got to ask you this question. You, you just became a partner at Bowie Scheller? Senator, I became a partner in 2020. Right. And you're going to give up all that big money? to join the federal bench. You worked for all that time. Senator, I've been in private practice for 20 years now. Yeah. Um, and uh, you, were, you were at Skadden Arps? I started my career at Skadden Arps. You spent a lifetime there in one week, didn't you? <laughs> I got in a lot terms of billable hours. <laughs> I sure did, Senator, and I also got a lot of great training. Yeah. Um, I've enjoyed my time in private practice, but uh, I, I believe in public service, and uh, I'm honored to have the opportunity if confirmed, to serve my country. Okay. Counselor, um, what, we, we know that the United States Supreme Court has, uh, has delimited, delineated certain classifications to be suspect classifications, right? What are they? Well, some examples of suspect... Uh, yeah, just list them for me because I don't have much time. Okay. Race is a suspect uh, right. classification. What else? 
Uh, national origin right. uh, is a suspect classification. Um, I think, uh, well, I'd have to look to see the rest. That's examples of two of them. Senator. Okay. What are the criteria for getting to be a suspect classification? I mean, we know that race and religion, as you said, and alienage and national origin are suspect classifications. But what are the criteria that, that, that a classification has, has to uh, uh, meet in order to be a suspect classification? Is that clear or am I being unclear? The, the, the question is clear. We'll see how clear my answer is. Okay. <laughs> uh, I've been a, a private practitioner for, for 35 years and I'd had uh, cause to have to examine that. Uh, but as I understand, at least one of the aspects of what makes a class a suspect classification um, is, is the fact that it is a, uh, a vulnerable uh, uh, population. Um, vulnerable, it, vulnerable how so? Politically so. For example, uh, the, the uh, classification of minorities as a suspect class uh, was an example of one that was uh, you know, politically uh, vulnerable. Uh, I know what that else? was one of the what factors. Else? Um, Senator, I'd have to, to research it to know, but that's what comes to mind. Okay. Judge, I'm going to land this plane in time. Uh, what's the Dorrant Commerce Clause? Senator, I appreciate your question. And as I sit here today after studying for the last two weeks, I just can't recall. I know I, it's in my note cards if you, if you want me to go grab them. Okay. And I apologize. Uh, okay. That's okay. I'm done. I, uh, uh, Mr. DeZeno, please tell Grassley I, I didn't ask you any questions. Okay? Thank you, Senator. You Very bet. Well. And Judge Beam, none of us on this side of the table would do very well with Kennedy's bar exam either, so. <laughs> Racial quotas. Uh, <clears throat> Senator, if I were faced with a question regarding racial quotas, I would carefully consider the binding Supreme Court precedent and Third Circuit precedent. Yes, I believe excuse me for interrupting, but that's not what I'm asking. Let me stipulate that you will follow. I'll stipulate this for all my questions to each of you that you will follow precedent. What I'm asking is about your beliefs. Do you believe in racial quotas? Uh, sir, if, if I were faced with that question, uh, I believe the Supreme Court has ruled that in the context, for instance- I, I know what the court's ruled, we, we both do. I'm just asking your personal beliefs. Um, do you believe in racial quotas? Uh, sir, uh, I want to be very careful since I am a judicial nominee. I certainly want, wouldn't want to say something that uh, would forecast for any future litigant I don't, how I don't, they thought I, don't, I would I don't rule. see the problem in you telling us your beliefs. I'm going to ask you one more time. Do you believe in racial quotas? Uh, I'm sorry, Senator. I, again, because I am a judicial nominee, I You're not going to answer me. It would not be prudent for me You're to not answer me. Okay. offer an opinion on All it. All right. Uh, do you believe... Once again, I'll stipulate that you're going to follow precedent. Do you believe that ab abortion is an issue that should be decided by the states? Uh, in the recent ruling in Dobbs, the Supreme Court did say that the question of abortion has been returned to the people and their elected yes, representatives. But I know, and I'll stipulate that you'll follow Dodge, Dobbs, but um, do you believe that abortion is an issue that should be decided by the states? I'm trying to understand what you believe? Well, certainly uh, under Dobbs, returning that issue to the people and their elected representatives does put it within the realm of the states. Okay. Do you believe that that's the right decision? Uh, Senator, I would not hesitate to apply uh, Dobbs yes, if I were faced with again, that. Once again, maybe I'm not being clear. I'm sorry. Do you, do you, I'm asking what you believe. Do you believe that abortion should be decided by the states as opposed to the federal government. Uh, Senator, again, uh, because I am a judicial nominee. You're not uh, going to answer. I don't believe it would be prudent to offer an opinion that would okay. allow future litigants to All right. um, think they could forecast. Do, do you believe that prosecutors should take it upon themselves to decide not to prosecute an entire class of crimes, even though that the legislative body uh, in that particular instance has designated the behavior as a crime? Uh, well, in my approximately or almost two decades as a prosecutor and now as United States Attorney, I have not found occasion to completely rule out I'm asking a what line you of believe, prosecution. Counselor? Uh, 
I, 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 I'm asking what you believe. Well, as a prosecutor and as a United States attorney, I believe that each investigation and matter should yes, be determined. Yes, ma'am, but do you believe a prosecutor should decide not, we both know what we're talking about. Do you believe that a prosecutor should take it upon themselves or himself or herself to say, I don't care what the legislature says. I'm not going to prosecute any shoplifting of uh, stealing of any goods if it's less than $950. Do you agree with that or not? Well, I would hope that my record as a prosecutor and United States attorney speaks to that question. I have not I'm uh, asking found you, occasion I'm giving to you a that. chance right now to speak to it. Tell me what you believe. Do you believe, I just gave you the example, do you, do you believe that's a good thing or a bad thing? I have not found occasion to rule out an entire rule, uh, line of prosecution. Okay, but, but if someone did, do you agree with it or disagree with it? Uh, I don't think I'm being obtuse here. Just answer my question if you wouldn't. If you're not, just tell me so I can move to, to the judge. Uh, Senator, I have not found a reason to do that in my own practice. I have only considered... Is that because you disagree with it? Well, I have found that uh, whether or not something reaches a federal interest for prosecution is something that has to be okay. determined right. on an I, individual I case. You, you, you're not going to answer me, and I, I really regret Thank that. you, Mr. Chairman, and congratulations to each of you. Uh, Ms. Hodge, uh, I'll start on the end. Um, I believe you have written, and I'm, I want to quote, the root cause of the killing of black people in America is systemic racism. Did you say that? Thank you for the question, Senator. Yes, that was that was a statement that was um, in a, an article that I believe I wrote um, shortly after the killing of George Floyd. Right. Um, and the, and it, and, and you, you believe that that the root cause of black on black crime in America is systemic racism. Uh, thank you for that question, Senator. I will say, I'm going to clarify, um, in that writing and in that quote, the quote is accurate, I would revise it to say that it's one of the root causes. Um, and to your point about black-on-black -black crime or, or crime in the country generally, um, any crime, um, there are many causes um, as to why people engage in criminal activity. Okay. Um, you also have advocated, quote, reallocating police funding what do you mean by that? Uh, you're, in that, I believe in, in a different, um, or maybe the same article or something else that, that I have written. One. Same article. I believe I listed um, a number of things that have been proposed, and I believe were being considered by Congress in following George Floyd. Right. In what, terms what do you think? How do you think we should reallocate police funding? Well, I will clarify that I wasn't advocating for the reallocation. That was one of the things that was listed, but I believe I that... I think you were, actually. You, your quote is, you advocated for, quote, reallocating police funding, and I'm just asking what you have in mind. Well, Senator, it has been some time, so I, I will say that I may not be recalling the entirety of the statement correctly. I thought I had listed it as one of the things that was proposed, but to your question, um, I believe that when a body such as Congress has the ability to make that consideration. No, um, I'm asking what you think, how you think we should reallocate police funding. Senator, I believe that that is something that is left to the body of Congress. I, I don't have um, an opinion to offer gonna, on you that. You don't have any opinion whatsoever? I believe that that's something that is left to those who are determining right. policy. You also advocated in the same article that we should eliminate qualified immunity for police officers. Is that correct? I would state that that is listed again as one of the listed proposed ideas that was being discussed. Actually, I extracted... No, you advocated for it. Senator, I extracted that from what was being discussed by Congress at the time following George Floyd. No, so I you advocated for it. I, I, I'm looking at the speech was entitled, quote, mandate for change will require collaboration, and you advocated eliminating qualified immunity for police officers, and I'm just asking you, did you, did you advocate for it, and if so, do you, do you still have that position? 
Senator, um, thank you for the question. I did not advocate for the um, elimination of qualified immunity, and qualified immunity is a doctrine within which has been recognized by the court, and if I were so fortunate to be confirmed, I would abide by the Supreme Court precedent and apply the law um, as it is stated. Okay. So you, you, you deny advocating for it? I would, to, to your question, Senator, I did not advocate for the elimination of qualified immunity. I listed it as one of the things that was being discussed and presented as something that was being dialogued um, by this body amongst others across the country as to be considerations. Okay. I don't think that's accurate. Um, Let me ask you about Kelly Honeywell. You remember that name? Um, Senator, I had I did not have any involvement in that actual case, but I am familiar with what you're referring to. Okay. Do uh, you remember Troy Stevenson? Yes. All right. Troy Stevenson was arrested, allegedly, for shooting Kelly Honeywell, Honeywell killing her, murdering her at a bakery. Mr. Honeywell was arrested, and Mr. Honeywell allegedly was a member of a gang. He owned, gu owned guns, and he did drugs, okay? You granted Mr. Stevenson bail. Is that right? I didn't. On that, in that case, I did not set bail uh, bond in that case um, when he was charged with um, murder. You didn't let him go? Not on the, I did not set the bond on the murder charge. Who did? I don't believe, I don't know who's. Uh, well, how did he get out of jail? On the, are you asking about the murder charge? M M what I'm asking, and I think you know what I'm asking. Mr. H Mr. Stevenson allegedly was arrested for shooting this bakery worker in the head. And he was granted bail. He was let out. You didn't grant the bail? No, sir. Who did? I, I, he, my understanding is his bond was denied in that case on the, on the murder case. Mr. Stevenson, I believe, after trial was found not guilty of those charges. But I did not set the bond on the murder case. I did not try the case on the murder case. I did not set the bond on the murder case. Okay. I think I'm out of time. Thanks, Judge. All right, thank you.